Thank you. Oh, I can hardly see that red circle. Can somebody I'll tilt it a little bit towards me? Thank you. Now it's behind a glass bottle. <laughs> Great. Oh, gee, I've lost about a minute already. Yep. Oh, look, I'll stop it. No, I'll it's all right. Oh, don't worry about it. Okay. Um, I think you're all aware that uh, in the last uh, four years there's been two reports come out of the Hauraki Gulf Forum, 2011 and 2014, both of which show the environmental health of the Hauraki Gulf spiralling downwards at quite an alarming rate and the whole sea change process really was sparked by the uh, sort of dire warnings included in the 2011 report in particular and um, of the sorts of effects that are occurring in the Gulf, two main ones really are sedimentation from the land, you know, the New Zealand European occupation is quite new and uh, we've had a lot of bush clearance and the uh, amount of sediment coming down as a result of that is quite devastating, done a lot of damage. The other big issue is fishing and particularly in the outer part of the Gulf where perhaps the sedimentation issues aren't so great, the main influence there is, is really fishing pressure. And people blame, you know, recreational fishermen tend to blame the commercial fishermen and commercial fishermen blame the recreational fishermen. The real problem arose some years ago when the Ministry of Fisheries decided in their wisdom to reduce the population of most of the commercial species to about 20% of their pre-fished biomass. Wiping out 80% of top predators in any ecosystem is not a good idea and it has huge impacts on the rest of the ecology and that's exactly what's happened in the Hauraki Gulf. We don't have enough snapper and we don't have enough crayfish in those particular species to maintain the very important ecosystem services that those species used to perform when they were there in sufficient numbers. And now with only 20% of them um, we have problems like kinnebarrens that Steve talked about and they're really widespread right in to the inner gulf around Waiheke, northern side of Waiheke, some of the worst kinnebarrens I've ever seen. And up until a few years ago we thought kinnebarrens only occur in the outer gulf. So really we need to build up the abundance of a lot of these species and I think um, there's problems with um, a lack of biodiversity and that the best tool we have for restoring biodiversity is really marine reserves. And we've talked around them a little bit. Um, people tend to sort of avoid talking about them because they're controversial. And, um, but there's very good reasons why um, they work really well. So we need to build up the abundance in the whole Gulf, but we also need a good network of marine reserves covering all the types of habitats in the Gulf. We need them not from a fisheries point of view, we need our marine reserves really just like national parks on land. They're there for biodiversity uh, recovery for a start and then protection. And um, I must be just about <coughs> run out, there we go. <laughs> Roger, can you start with explaining to me why people don't like marine reserves, why they're so controversial? Well, I think to some extent it's a myth. There's been a number of um, surveys done nationwide and something like 80% of the population actually want more marine reserves. The opposition to them is usually recreational and to some extent commercial fishing and in a way they're actually a minority but they're very very vocal um, whenever you sort of try and create a marine reserve anywhere the recreational fishermen get particularly well organized and make a big noise but the people in favor of them aren't like that they don't organize themselves well and um, produce a lot of support 
and it seems to me like I, I come from a background that um, you know I enjoyed Goat Island as a kid, but just um, the thought of having more marine reserves in the Hauraki Gulf as a as a recreational fisherman that did a lot of it, um, it kind of scared me to be honest until the last probably the last seven years hanging out with people like yourself. But it's just in theory most people seem to like the idea of marine reserves, but when it comes to choosing where they go, it's uh, most people don't like them in their back doorsteps, it seems. And, uh, you know, the thing with New Zealand is everywhere is a back doorstep for somebody, you know. And it just seems to be, um, it seems to be nearly impossible to make them happen these days as well. That you've got to have a lot of guts and stickability to, to stick through the years to actually make it happen. And they're normally a big compromise when they do. And that's what it seems to me. Mm. And the government has backed away from them as well. Um, we used to be leaders, world leaders of uh, marine conservation and marine reserves, but... Um, it was about, when was it, 1996, I think, the government decided that DOC couldn't actually apply for marine reserves or actually be a joint applicant, whereas a lot of the reserves prior to that were partly DOC um, instigated or certainly with other partners. So there's no political will within the government at the moment to uh, create more marine reserves. I think the... Um, they probably realise that long term marine reserves have quite an economic advantage, an economic benefit, but short term uh, they tend to be regarded as sort of negative. Um, Roger, can I ask why you think it might be that recreational fishermen don't understand the notion that, um, you know, fish need to restock themselves and why? Because surely recreational fishermen are people that, you know, want there to be lots of fish for themselves to catch. I mean, why do you think they're so ignorant about, you know, the fact that fish need to, you know, they need to be left alone so that they can restock themselves? Um, I really don't know. Um, I've, I've done a number of presentations to fishing clubs and, and sort of the converted as well and forest and bird and, and what have you. And when you're talking to individual fishermen, often they actually, they get it and, and end up sort of being supportive of marine reserves in general. The uh, single biggest piece of marine protection that's been implemented in re of recent times is the Tapuna Ma Tai Tai mm. in uh, the Purirua Peninsula in the northern uh, Bay of Islands. And the New Zealand Sport Fishing Council and the Bay of Island Swordfish Club in option four led the support for that Ma Tai Tai as the Te Komite um, Kaitiaki of the Maranai Taiamai 14 Hapu fought through a truly torturous process with the government where one commercial fisherman who fished part-time a few tonnes of crayfish that he leased, ironically, from Napui, held up the entire closure for eight years. Judah Heihei, who initiated it, died. A number of them, Ray Kapa, died in despair as these, as their attempt to bring their kaitiakitanga obligation to the table was defeated by this uh, bloody-minded attitude of if it prevents me harvesting my sacred property right, it's not going to happen. So that was that's huge. That that's like about four goat islands in, in its uh, volume. I'm, uh, I'm conscious, um, Scott, that we're actually running out of time very rapidly, and I would like to concentrate on marine reserves which are total no-take. Matai are not that. Um, Matai are sort of glorified fisheries management. The idea of marine reserves is to create areas that can um, act as national parks in the sea. Okay, the issue here is that we're using, m much of this conversation has seen us talking about the use of marine reserves as a fisheries management tool. And that's where, it's not about recreational fishermen being ignorant, quite the reverse. We know what we're talking about, we know the law, we know the limitations of the blunt instrument called the Marine Reserves Act, 
and we wait with bated breath year after year for the new legislation that we keep getting promised to come through to give marine reserves some meaningful legislative status because they lack that right now. There is no way that we can have what you're after under the Marine Reserves Act. And we all know that. We've got the minutes of the fourth meeting of the stakeholder working group where the Department of Conservation turns up and says to you chaps on the stakeholder working group, let's not worry about the law. Don't let the, rule, the law constrain the way you're thinking. Uh, we've got something coming through. We're, you know, there's this new legislation coming where the proponents of the Marine Reserve, I believe, do themselves a real disservice is promoting them as a fisheries management tool. When we have this remarkable piece of legislation called the Fisheries Act and a multi-billion dollar investment by society as we choose to privatise our fisheries, and we're just simply not allowing for it to be exercised. Um, just following through, and I think... Um access and cultural activities, uh, there is a space in between where there is a, 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 t a, a place where we can actually meet in the middle. Um, I think no take marine reserves exclude the public from their cultural activities, whether they be mana whenua cultural activities or third generation Kiwis that have been here for a long time that they actually are, have their own Tūranga Waiwai. So um, I think my issue with no take, I know my issue with no take is that it's an exclusion of the connection that if we, if we keep people out of those places, it will just make it more difficult to get that connection. What we need to do is find that middle ground where we can still have cultural activities, but there is a biodiversity conservation that is achieved um, without scaring people away from it. And um, yep, that's, that would be a goal. I think if, oh, sorry, if, if you have total no take areas, that's the only areas in which the fish life can recover to a fully natural state. And I think um, when you say people can't connect with that, you just look at the number of people going to go to Ireland and grooving at those mm. great big snapper. Right. Similarly with the poor nights, people love that sort of thing mm. and they yeah. do feel a real connection with the sea. But you will only achieve those um, full recovered systems if you have no take. Any mm. amount of, small amount of fishing will prevent the big fish developing. Yeah, just so, I want to add to, to Roger's yeah. point. All you need to do is to go on a summer weekend to Goat Island mm. to see the value. Forget about all the other benefits biologically, ecologically. The economic value, the recreational value of no-take marine reserves. A very typical piece of New Zealand coastline in Goat Island was protected in the 1970s. And now the problem is visitor management because it's so bloody popular. Mm. Ask the owners of the Sawmill Cafe in Lee... Mm -hmm if Goat Island Marine Reserve as a no-take was a good idea. <laughs> you know, ask the people who go there and take people to learn to dive. When I've done survey work up there, Aucklanders take visitors to their homes to Goat Island to show them with pride what's been achieved there. Mm. So that's the best example and argument that we can make for marine reserves. And so for me, it's one of those no-brainers. It just makes sense. We're not mm. talking about it for all the golf or even a significant proportion of it, a representative small proportion, and it makes a massive positive difference in all measures, economically, culturally, mm. in terms of people accessing what the marine environment actually was like and is supposed to be like and connecting with that. It makes a difference biologically. So it is the proverbial no-brainer. Oh. Mm. I um, stopped the clock a while ago because that was interesting and I wanted <laughs> to let it run, but I think I might have to call it there. Thank you very much to Roger and to the rest of the panel.